Welcome to everybody who's joining us online to this evening's Paul Mellon Centre Research Seminar on Frank Bowling, The Mother's House Paintings. Um, I'm Martin Marron. I'm Head of Grants, Fellowships and Networks um, at the Paul Mellon Centre, and it's my pleasure to introduce to this evening's speakers. In a moment, I'll be handing over to Grace Aniza Ali, who is a curator and assistant professor in the Department of Art and the Department of Art History's Museum and Cultural Heritage Studies Program at the College of Fine Arts, Florida State University. That's very long, very impressive. Um, Grace is a uh, curator scholar of contemporary art of the Global South, whose curatorial research practice examines the conceptual links and slippages at the nexus of art and migration. And uh, Ali, uh, Grace uh, specializes in art of the Caribbean diaspora with particular attention to her homeland, Guyana. And that's reflected in her extensive record of publication and curation, including a book, Liminal Spaces, Migration and Women of the Guyanese Diaspora, um, and did her earlier research on Frank Bowling, which I'm glad to say, uh, pleased to say was supported by Paul Mellon Center Curatorial Research Grant. Uh, Grace was also a participant in our British Art Network um, Curatorial Forum in New York and New Haven back in 2022. Um, that's supported by the Paul Mellon Center as well. So we've got a bit of history, so it's fantastic to have, uh, have you here this evening to hear uh, your work. Now this evening um, is going to begin with uh, Grace's talk, and there's going to be a, a film clip, and then a conversation with uh, Grace and Ben uh, Bowling, who is Professor of Criminology and Criminal Justice at King's College London, uh, who's uh, written a succession of books, Violent Racism, Police in the Caribbean, Global Policing, and The Politics of the Police, which examine police accountability in the local, national, and transnational spheres, um, alongside Further uh, uh, academic uh, roles, uh, advisory and charity work, which are detailed for uh, an, an online biography. Um, ben is also uh, Frank Bowling's middle son and with his brother, co-directs his father's studio. So fantastic to have you here this evening. So uh, just to say the evening is, yeah, firstly, uh, Grace, uh, uh, Grace's talk, then a short clip. Um, and then uh, from 5.30 to 6.30 or thereabouts, there's going to be Ben and Grace in conversation. And there'll be chance for Q&A. Q&A, uh, questions from the floor. But also, if you're, if you're attending online, you can submit, submit questions online. And they can be put to our, uh, our speakers this evening as well. So uh, with that, I think it's nothing more to do other than to, uh, um, welcome Grace to the stand. Thank you, Martin. It is. It does feel very much like a full circle moment. And so first things first, just to share my gratitude to the wonderful team of the Paul Mellon Center, including Martin and Shreya and Ella and Kathleen and Sarah Turner. Of course, I couldn't do any of this work without the incredible generosity of the Bowling family, um, especially Ben, who I'm so grateful is sharing his time with us tonight and the Bowling Archive and the staff and the team from the Bowling Archive. Thank you all so much for your incredible time. So I'm going to share for the next 25 minutes or so, don't time me on that, but um, just how I am reading these mother's house paintings through a lens of migration. So for the past six decades, as most of us uh, would agree, Guyanese-born British artist Sir Frank Bowling has been defined by his mastery of color abstraction. And this is perhaps most largely exemplified by these wonderful, critically acclaimed map paintings, extraordinarily large-scale works with the stenciled outlines of maps of Guyana, South America, and other land masses. But before the map paintings, and perhaps even as a precursor to them, were a series of early figurative and abstract works, informally regarded, and this isn't a formal title, but informally regarded by Bowling as the Mother's House paintings. Although lesser exhibited and oftentimes lesser examined in scholarship, they hold a very special place for the artist in his ovoir. They're defined by a singular architectural motif. This 1953 photograph of the house that Bowling grew up in and often returned to, 
his mother's house in New Amsterdam, British Guyana. Bowling screen printed this image onto multiple blank canvases, stockpiling them, even taking them unfinished across international borders. And this photograph of the three-story clapboard colonial house on Main Street would secure its place as an inescapable presence in his paintings and actually in many of their adjoining titles. From this singular photograph, the artist produced approximately 25 to 30 paintings and counting from the mid-1960s to the early 1970s. And there's a little footnote, I say and counting, because Bowling often disappeared the photograph into these paintings. And so we're still doing this wonderful detective work of deciphering the, really the full extent of them, which for a geek like me is really delicious work to sink your teeth in. And for the studio, I'm sure, as well. But first, I'd like to show you a little montage of just the incredible range and breadth in which the artist engaged with and treated the image of his mother's house. Through the paintings, we see Bowling's actions of layering, overpainting, tripling, veiling, stitching, outlining, even engulfing in fiery blazes, and obscuring and erasing the image to the point where we can't see its material presence. Bowling's varied artistic treatments often evoke a sense of displacement and scattering. We see him meticulous in illuminating the house's aesthetic possibilities, as well as its personal and political narratives. We see him treat the image with both great care as well as violence. In turn, throughout the paintings, the house appears as central in some, as a silhouette, as ghostly, as faint, as volatile, looming, fragile, but always present and always formidable. So how can a house, just a house, reflect migration's arcs, its losses, and its gains? And this is the question that has really drawn me into these paintings. I, too, am, am Guyanese-born, as Martin shared. And when I go back to Georgetown, Guyana, my first ritual of return is always to visit the house where I grew up and spent my childhood. And that house is now abandoned or I walk through the neighborhood and I'm encountering even more abandoned houses. The colonial style house I grew up in on Middle Road no longer belongs to my family. Its present state of decay and disrepair conflicts with my memory of its vibrancy when I left 25 years ago. It wasn't a beloved house, nor was it hated, but it held me and it gathered the people that I love. Houses, provide a frame that bears us up, writes Sarah Broom in her really stunning memoir, The Yellow House, about her own beloved New Orleans home in the American South, which was swept away by Hurricane Katrina. She continues that without that physical structure, we are the house that bears itself up. The house is witness to our lives. So what would compel any of us because I know I'm not the only one that does this, but what would compel any of us to reenact rituals of return like these, to confront an architecture left behind? These questions have drawn me to Bowling's mother's house paintings, not just curatorially, but in a deeply personal way. And as I began a close study of them, I wondered about Bowling's own rituals of return to this house, physically, artistically, and psychically, Bowling talks often about how the house shows up in his dreams. What was he too confronting in this architecture? As Broom writes here, how did his mother's house bear him up? To understand these paintings and to read them from a lens of migration, we have to first examine the 1953 photograph itself. 
what it reveals about the house, about the town, about New Amsterdam, and equally important about the person both the house and the paintings are named for, Bowling's mother. Critic Mel Gooding has called the photograph a motif that carried the elusive charge of a memory of home. And similarly, the lay curator Okuya Wenzor deemed it a transitive image that marked the start of a look back to Guyana and that it served as a talisman. The photograph captures the view of the house on Main Street as Bowling saw it in 1953 when he first left British Guyana. The photographer is unknown, and who sent it to Bowling is still shrouded in a bit of mystery. It's useful here to inscribe the scholar Tina Camp's compelling work on archival photographs and her book titled Listening to Images. In her critical theory, she urges us to move beyond simply looking at the image for what is visible and instead to actually listen to the image, to listen for what is quiet in them, for what is speaking to us in ways that might be invisible. And so I invoke a sort of similar listening practice as I examine this 1953 image. The photograph is a gateway to a liminal space. It is both a symbol of new beginnings as well as departure. And we have to think of it, Bowling is just a mere 19 years old here in 1953. He's leaving his homeland for the first time for London. The photograph is thought to have been taken around June 2nd, Coronation Day of Queen Elizabeth II. And if you look at the image on the right in front of the house, you can see the British flag, the symbol of empire as it sways from a flagpole. The photograph quietly telegraphs to us that Bowling is leaving one version of empire for another. The photograph is about a house. It captures the grandiose architectural beauty of the many historical colonial wooden houses that still dominate Guyana's landscape. And large capital letters painted on the awning declare the shop, Bowling's Variety Store, which Bowling's mother operated on the ground floor. Bountiful windows circle the second story, allowing for a breeze and a reprieve from the heat. The third story is sheltered with a high-pitched triangular zinc roof. And in the background, to the left, a, wind a windswept palm tree looms above it. Its architectural features are a testament to the craftsmanship of skilled Guyanese builders who were part of the country's Amerindian and African and Asian people. And these local builders married the aesthetic leanings of colonial architects with their own expert understanding of what was needed to make a house a home in the region's tropical climate. The photograph quietly tells us that this is a house to be proud of. Bowling often says the house was built up around him. And indeed, while it was being built, his role was to be the night watchman, guarding the house and the expensive building materials. The photograph is about the woman standing in the open gate, Bowling's mother, Miss Agatha Chrissy Bowling. Miss Agatha, I call her Miss Agatha because in Guyana we call her elders Miss, so pardon me. Miss Agatha was a formidable figure not only in Bowling's life but in the town of New Amsterdam. She purchased this land and built this house on it she started and operated the variety store, which also functioned as her dressmaking business. She took care of the town's destitute and its vulnerable. She was a skilled seamstress. She's been called charismatic, entrepreneurial, a maker in her own right, a designer of beautiful dresses and hats. She sold saris and design and de designated a young bowling to help measure and cut the fabric for the women who came into the shop. In examining just the language of the titles to these paintings, I find it telling what bowling did not call them. Outside of a few exceptions, 
he did not assign titles such as the house on Main Street or the new Amsterdam house or even as the awning declares the bowling variety store. Instead, he repeatedly assigned the name Mother's House into their titles and even parenthetically. Bowling is also a poet and knowing his love for language, I have to think this act of naming is in itself a poetic signaling to the main character in the image, Miss Agatha Bowling. What the photograph quietly tells us is that as much as the house is central to the mother's house paintings, so is Bowling's mother equally central. What the photograph doesn't show us, however, is that this woman standing in the gate was in rare company. At the time, she was the only black woman in the town of New Amsterdam to own property and own her own business, which you'll see shortly for New Amsterdam was no small feat. The photograph is about a place. In 1953, Bowling left British Guyana at a time rife with political unrest as the colony moved towards its long journey to independence from British colonial rule, which actually wouldn't come some 13 years later in 1966. So all Bowling had known was Guyana as colonized. He spent the impressionable years of his adolescence here in New Amsterdam, Guyana's oldest town. It's a port town on the Burbies River, 60 miles from the capital city of Georgetown. Bowling has said of New Amsterdam that it is the most important place and that it reappears all the time. It was a town that was full of terror and at the same time, it was marvelous. It belonged to me. The photograph is also, as Bowling notes, about terror. And that terror came in many forms. It was the terror of racism, of ethnic divisions, of segregation and disenfranchisement under the iron fist of colonial rule. It was the terrible terror of violence within the walls of his own home. And it was the terror of entrenched poverty of what was and remains one of the poorest countries in the Western Hemisphere. So this collection of terrors is articulated in several works from the Mother's House series. In these paintings, Bowling is gesturing towards New Amsterdam as a deeply tumultuous and vulnerable relationship and gesturing towards that terror and that colonial violence. In the first work, Mother's House, Beware of the Dog, the facade of the house is more prominently visible than in other works. It appears in the top half of the painting in a fiery blaze of red. There's subtext of alarm and perhaps even violence. An ominous creature the dog alluded to in the title dominates the lower half of the painting. And along its right edge, the words beware of the dog are stenciled. It implores the viewer to interrogate a visceral danger haunting the work, the aesthetic of alarm that house emblazoned in fiery red continues in other works as well. So what we carry across borders what we pack among our sacred things, especially if we are packing up an old life and departing for a new one, is not only an intentional act, but it can be quite revealing. This 1953 photograph of the house found its way from British Guyana to London. 13 years later in 1966, as Bowling shifts his practice to New York City, the image crossed international borders yet again albeit not in its original form. While still in London, Bowling had started screen printing the mother's house photograph onto a stockpile of blank canvases and working on them. In this photo, we see Bowling in his London studio in 1966. He's working on two of the earlier works from the series, Cover Girl and Old Hag, and you can see them propped up on the wall in the background, still unfinished. Later that same year, when Bowling moved to New York, what did he take with him? 
that stash of canvases screen printed with Mother's House. Perhaps he carried the image with him because of what was happening in British Guyana that same year. The country finally became independent of British rule. But these canvases were certainly important to him. And even without a studio, Bowling worked on them on the floor of the Chelsea Hotel in New York City, where he was staying when he first moved. We live in the age of the image. And at the moment, I'm teaching a class for my graduate students called the Migrant Image. And with them, we're examining the mobility of the image, meaning how the image moves through the world itself impacts the way that we're reading the image. And I have to remind them that images crossing borders, um, they seem to think it's an unremarkable thing in our 21st century digital world. And I have to remind them that in times like 1953, this was an era before JPEGs and TIFF files, when the tangible photograph stood among some of our most prized possessions. So the migratory life of this little 1953 photograph was extraordinary. In its material form, it had traveled from British Guyana to London to New York City. And in its painting form, it had traveled through the world. Essentially, it too becomes a migrant image. So in reading migration in these paintings, we not only examine Bowling's looking back to Guyana, but we also take into account his acts of return. Between when he first left British Guyana in, and into the 1970s, the period in which these paintings were made, Bowling returned to Guyana multiple times. What was calling back to him? He was constantly trying to understand why this place remained in his psyche, but in a way that wasn't already legible and what this place, this house, these relationships meant in his work. So he returned to New Amsterdam and Mother's House three times between 1962 and 1970, which was, as you can imagine, very costly to do. I was struck by what led to the first time Bowling returned to British Guyana and what he gave up to make that passage. In 1962, he was offered a travel scholarship to Rome, and instead, he requested the funds be used so he could return to Guyana for the first time. The second trip to Guyana was in 1968. As part of this trip, bowling and photographer Tina Tranter attempted to make a film about his life. They shot 16 millimeter footage capturing the town of New Amsterdam and scenes around the house on Main Street. And the Frank Bowling Archive has been able to restore this footage. We'll be showing you a clip of that shortly. But I want to use this 1968 return to reiterate this question again of what was calling back to Bowling in these returns. He was responding to increasing questions from his contemporaries in London and New York about his identity and his roots in Guyana. In a 1994 interview, he remarked that the film was a way to, quote, bridge the gap between the Guyana that had only the faintest inkling of and how my work had developed. And so as he continued grappling with this 1953 photograph, these multiple acts of return to Guyana not only had an impact on individual works, but they were also shifting the way that he was thinking about painting, and in particular, engaging with the visibility of the mother's house image. As these paintings appeared more and more autobiographical to viewers, the curiosity about the role of his identity and his work heightened. But Bowling was increasingly resistant to appeasing desires towards transparency and legibility in his work. In the poetic intelligence he so masterfully wielded, as I noted in the ways he titled these works, he was calling for, quote, the right to opacity as articulated by another Caribbean poet and theorist, Edouard Glissant. A year after his 1970 trip to Guyana, now his third return, Bowling had a solo show at the Whitney Museum in New York. 
He's quoted in that exhibition's catalog, invoking in so many words, I think, that right to opacity, saying that the most marvelous state for the painting is both its giving a certain kind of information and also withholding it, and that a most important aspect of a painter is to be involved in the ambiguous. So what power does the unknowable, the illegible, the inarticulable have? And how do we grapple with art that doesn't call to be understood, that resists transparency? And what is the migrant's right to opacity? This right to opacity that Bowling was claiming showed up across treatments of erasing, overprinting, layering, whitening, and particularly here, ghosting the mother's house image. Bowling begins to combine the house with stenciled maps and silhouettes of Guyana and South America, evidence that the mother's house paintings were a significant gateway to the map paintings. And in this first work, Mother's House Overprinted times three, the house is replicated three times. As one body, it now resembles a glowing ghost-like ship floating in vast space. That ghosting is repeated in the second work, Mother's House with South America. By the time we get to the third work, we are given a blazing, dusty, white, shadowed outline of just the architectural shape of the house. It almost all but disappears. In all three of these works, the mother's house image has some form of illegibility. In one, we sense its presence more so than we see it. In others, it's ambiguous. But in all of them, it is transcending into a more mythical object than a literal representation. This work similarly palimpsest, which full disclosure is my favorite of them. Um, I hear it's traveling next year in Washington, DC, so I'll be there. Um, the mother's house image is tripled again here and then faded and in some parts erased. It becomes barely visible through clouds of red and green paint and an attempt at erasure that directly invokes the palimpsest referenced in its title. And some straight traces of the structure still remain visible, even after it has been eclipsed and erased and altered many times over. The experience of migration is not always easily articulable. It is in itself full of contours and absences, silences, erasures, losses, and certainly opacities. And through these works of the mother's house paintings, we see that the more the curiosity heightened about Bowling's migration story, the more he reached for that right to opacity. And finally, in his looking back to Guyana via this photograph, via his paintings, and in his own multiple returns, Bowling understood something that I think is quite counterintuitive when we talk about migration. We tend to think of migration as a one-way street. We center the leaving. But the migration arc exists on a spectrum. And it inscribes those who leave, those who are left, those who choose to remain, those who return, and those who simply cannot. Bowling understood that to examine the migrant self is not only to grapple with the act of leaving, but it is to contend with one's relationship to who and what is left, a house, a mother, a place. As we'll hear from Ben shortly, mother's house no longer exists on Main Street. And Bowling has shared that his mother, who passed away in 1988, actually never saw these paintings. Perhaps Bowling and that migrant part of himself that he often tapped into intuited that a house which meant so much to him would be lost, lost to time, lost to a country caught up in forging an unknowable future, lost to the inevitability of change, and certainly lost to the fickleness of memory. Frank Bowling's singular act to screen print the image of this house 
and send it out through the world was a way to keep it forever present, to give it a future, and like he once did as a young boy, to remain its watchman. Thank you. In the early years of my life, we lived in Pope Street, um, and she bought about half the street on one side and turned one of the buildings into this, built a storefront, and, which is where she started up her, her um, uh, bowling's variety store bit, um, uh, um, selling small items as well as um, uh, doing dressmaking and making hats. And from Pope Street, she moved to Main and St. John on the Main Street, just opposite the Catholic Church, immediately, right opposite, and uh, built this big uh, three-story house with the, 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 the ground floor being the, the shop and uh, the, the places where all these machines for sort of sewing. Uh, um, it's been said, and again, you know, I don't know how true it is, she, she, that she had the first electrical sewing machine in the town. She had about six Singer sewing machines of all sorts. And then she had all this pleating gear, you know, for pleating skirts and um, embroidery machines and God knows what. Uh, um, now, she, she started this all up on her own. On her own. Uh, that her parents didn't have a... No, they didn't leave any money behind. Her, no? no. So this is a very remarkable kind of story. Yeah. Martin read your wonderful bio, Ben, but my favorite part about your bio is you identify yourself as Frank's middle son. And I think that's very sweet and very touching. But I thought we'd start with Ben walked in and said to me, you had a very important dream at 3 a.m. this morning about the house. So I thought we would open up with that. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Grace. Um, fantastic presentation. Um, I'm so pleased that this is being recorded so we can share it with Dad and uh, the rest of the family. Um, so uh, Grace kindly showed me some questions that we would look at. And um, I've been ill. I'm just recovering from dengue fever. And um, so I didn't have much time to prepare, but I did look at them before going to bed. And at 3 o'clock in the morning, I woke, and I'm not sure whether it was a dream or daydream or planning or whatever it was, I had this thought that um, there should be a, a play in four acts on the mother's house. It would all take place in the house or on the house. Um, the first act is a building site and it's got the lumber and the, the tools and the nails and the screws and so on. And asleep amongst the pile of lumber is an 11-year-old boy. Uh, this is 1945. Second World War has just finished. And uh, Richard Sheridan Franklin Bowling, known as Frankie, is asleep in a makeshift sleeping bag. And his job at 11 is to guard the, the site overnight to prevent people coming to steal the timber and the, and the tools. The second act is 1950. Uh, he's now called Pat, uh, Rich, um, Richard Sheridan Patrick Michael Aloysius Franklin Bowling. He's converted to Catholicism. Um, so this is 1950, he's 16 years old. Um, the conversion is a defiance of his father, who's an Anglican, and his mother. His father's a policeman, and he fears that Richard Sheridan, he's also called Richard Sheridan, is going off the rails. He's going to become a stray boy. He's very defiant. And in this act, the scene is still in the house. Uh, in defiance of his father, he has smashed every one of the display cases in the shop. Smashed them, I think, with a cricket bat. Smashed to pieces, to smithereens. By way of punishment, his father has handcuffed him with his police handcuffs by the legs to the house. 
to prevent him from running away. And beats him with an unimaginable cruelty. Um, I'll spare you the details, but in his interview with Mel Gooding, he describes horrors that Grace alluded to, including a, a deeply disturbing incident with a, a saw left in the sun. Um, his mother saves him, and he, the saving is that she says, if you'll be my huckster, a kind of traveling salesman, and you'll cycle from New Amsterdam to Georgetown, and New Amsterdam to Skeldon, which is on the Suriname border, on a carrier bike, and take orders for saris and sell ribbons and lace. Any money that you make, you can use for whatever purpose you wish. And he said, I'll, I'll use that for my passage to England. So from the age of about 16 till his departure in, uh, at the age of 19, he saves up the money and he flees the terror of the home and also arrives in Britain. Um, the third act is 19... 68, when he returns with Tina Tranter to make the film, and finds this image. Um, things have shifted, clearly, because now you're, the house is decorated with a Guyanese flag and the, the bunting is uh, red, yellow, and green, rather than the red, white, and blue. And he finds his father a different kind of man. Um, you know, his, his mother puts her hand on his shoulder. He, he's an elderly man sweeping. And then the final act is 1989, his last visit to Guyana, where he finds the house demolished. His mother has died the previous year. And Rachel, my stepmom, recalls seeing a photograph of just the tiles, the tiled floor. So it kind of takes you almost like full circle. Um, from a building site to another building site. And um, I have no idea. I can't, I can't write a play. <laughs> but it struck me that these episodes, and Grace also alluded to them, tell us something about what lies behind the paintings, what lies behind the image of the house, what it means for him as an artist, what his journey, what his... his migratory journeys from Guyana to London and from London to New York and back again. What kinds of meanings are left? The residues of them. Um, that what starts out as a very stark and striking kind of polarized image turns into something largely erased and indistinct. And some of the very later, the, 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 the latest works is, I mean, Hafif is fantastic. Um, but works like um, Raining Down South, where you can just barely make out the house. It's there with other stencils, stencils of South America and Guyana, and Mother's House is there, but it's almost completely erased. But not completely. It, the residues remain, and uh, when Grace visited a few nights ago and talked to him, you can, I think we could tell that the, the feeling about the place and about his mother those residues, they remain in his psyche today. How, do you recall when you first started hearing about not just the house and what it meant to your father, but started really seeing or hearing about his use of that image in the, in the paintings? Has he always talked about it to his family or is this something that you learned of later? I guess, it, for me, it starts with the paintings. Um, Cover Girl, for me, is one of the most striking works. Um, I mean, we'll talk a little bit about the sort of legacy of this later on, but for me, Cover Girl is, well, it's an iconic painting. It has uh, the Japanese model figured in the center of the work. Um, it was a, 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 an Observer magazine cover, 1966. And the mother's house is there behind. This. So there's, there's sort of cosmopolitan pop art 
there's, you know, it, it kind of feels a bit Warholish or maybe Pete Blake. Um, but there in the background is this, is this house. So I think that's probably where it starts for me, intrigued by the house. And I asked him about it, and he talked about, you know, the house that he grew up in that was built around him. Um, and then I suppose uh, the, um, Mel Gooding's interviews. So uh, Mel Gooding, who died a couple of years ago now, did the first monograph on Dad's work. But he interviewed him over more than 20 hours for the British Library. And you can hear the, the tapes on, you can hear the, the tapes online and we have the transcript. So reading about the house in those, I suppose, I mean, I'm a bit geeky like you, um, intrigued by what that house meant. Um, and then seeing its rep repetition in the works is sort of fascinating. And I, in the early 1990s, I got to know my cousin, Chetwind, who's named for Frank's youngest brother, uh, middle, middle brother, Chet, um, talking with him about his experiences of growing up, um, I think not in the house, but nearby, and connecting, and probably also the, my first visit to Guyana um, in 2004. So, but I think it starts actually strangely with the paintings. And it's a, an iconic image, but it's also got something to do with my grandmother, who I never met. So I guess those are the, the associations for me. So that is a perfect segue to the next question. I'm always struck when there is scholarship around the mother's house, how little Miss Agatha Bowling is actually talked about. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to correct that a bit because I do think these paintings are an homage to his mother as much as it is, it is to the house. How did you first encounter the, the largeness of Agatha Bowling? And mm. if you can share with them also the portrait that you have in your home of her. Yeah. Well, I think Dad, he did always speak about her and with great affection. And the interviews with Mel Gooding are really tremendous in this regard. It begins there, really. He thinks that he was her favorite child, the eldest son. Um, and he was born with a call, which is a, you know, born with the, inside the amniotic sac. It's a, it's a strange um, phenomenon but taken in many cultures as a mark of somebody who will achieve some kind of greatness and also the ability to see the future. So um, he always talked about uh, how she would take him to seances as an infant, not an infant, but as a preteen anyway, um, where he was, he, he, it was something to do with rain water, a fresh egg, and the, I, I don't exactly know what they would do, but he would somehow look at these things in a sort of shaman-like way and read the future. People would ask, you know, what was going to happen to them next. And he was able to do that until, he, until puberty. Various other strange rituals that were in there. It's kind of got to do with obia and, you know, um, sort of, I guess, African religions and spirituality. And he was very precious to her, but she was also a, um, a disciplinarian, an Anglican. I think both mother and father beat him. Um, and I think, yes, this larger-than-life figure who was this businesswoman who had started a shop in another street and then built this house and had created a kind of property empire by the time that she passed away, but not a trusting woman. I think that she, she always felt that, I mean, and he talked about it the other night, the idea that maybe he would come back and run the store. Um, I think in the 50s, when he had, was doing his national service, she expected him to, to go shopping for uh, spare parts for the Singer sewing machines. And he, he remembers going down Brick Lane and, and buying zips and buttons and lace to send back. Um, actually, in a way, it's where his, 
story as, a, as an artist begins because in walking back from Brick Lane with all these products, he, um, he happened across um, the Whitechapel Gallery and, um, and went in. And it was a, a famous exhibition called something like um, This Is Tomorrow. And uh, he said he had no idea that this stuff, typography and architecture and painting and drawing, could be art, about 1955 or thereabouts. Um, so I think, you know, a difficult relationship with his parents. Um, he said that recently, I think he said to Mel, he'd never, he, rem he, he can't remember ever having a conversation with his father. And when he left in 53, he didn't say goodbye to him. But there was this kind of that continued con connection with his mother. I think that, I mean, as you know now, that there's a certain amount of correspondence. Very, very beautiful handwritten air, air mail letters um, from his father to him, and his not when from his mother to him, and his brother and sister. So I think that connection, even though, I mean, I'm one of three sons, all with different mums, not exactly a family man, uh, um, at least not from the mother's point of view. But somehow he managed to um, break the cycle. Um, you mentioned terror and the violence. Um, so, yes, I'm sad that I didn't ever meet her. Um, my last visit was in 2019. I went with my youngest son, Frederick. Um, and we, did, we went looking for her grave. Um, and in Guyana, because everything is, is below sea level, um, the, the graves are all like tombs that are elevated. And we found the record of her, of her burial. Unfortunately, the grave digger at the time was not a very good record keeper and didn't record the plot number. The, the current grave digger was very um, angry about and um, critical of his predecessor. So it's a huge space. And we found that there was really no way to, to go and find this space, which is a source of sadness. So I think that I didn't ever meet my grandmother or my grandfather, who's a source of sadness to me. And yet, she still feels quite present in the photographs. And I have a, a, um, um, a print, I think it's an etching, um, called Mother's, Mother Approaching 60, which is this fantastic photograph, a 68 photograph, um, where Frank, my, where Dad's drawn a circle around. She's got a very round face and drawn this circle. Um, the circle in the square is a significant motif for him in his artwork. And she's got this sort of kind of beatific smile. Um, and she's um, on the wall in our flat. And so when I'm lying on the sofa of an evening and my glass of soda water, I can sort of, I can sit and look at her. And now I've, I was approaching 60, I'm no longer approaching. Um, but I felt like a, a sort of connection there with her. And Ben, of course, we wish we had another ending to the story of this house. What happened to the house on Main Street? I don't really know exactly. It was demolished. Um, the house next door that you can see just off to the left is still standing. The Catholic Church opposite is still standing. Um, I would say probably about one in three of the original 50s houses are still standing. Um, I think that what happened was that, so Richard Sheridan Sr. died first in the end of the 70s, and Agatha Elizabeth, she's called Chrissy, by the way, because she was born on Christmas Day and was known by, to everybody as Chrissy. Um, she died in uh, 1988, just before Dab went and exhibited his paintings for the first time in 1989, um, together with Dennis Dakaris, um Guyanese painter, still working, uh, rather excellent painter. Um, and by the time he arrived, so within a year of her passing, the house was already demolished. Um, it was replaced with a similar looking but concrete building, which is quite common in, in Guyana. There's, um, um, I think 
my visits there have been very educative. And I think that, perhaps it's a slight tangent, where effort has been put into restoring these buildings, they've been abs become absolutely fantastic. The main cathedral in, um, in Georgetown has recently been restored. It's the, it's the largest wooden um, cathedral church anywhere in the world. It's an extraordinary, with wooden flying buttresses. It's a, an extraordinary place. And I, um, I came across a building which I didn't know what it was, and it was only through um, seeing uh, an artwork by Hugh Locke, um, who's here this evening, um, of the Masonic Lodge in New Amsterdam. Um, in Hugh's version, it's um, surrounded by water. Um, but that's been restored and is a, a, an extraordinary building. And um, I don't know whether Compton is here this evening, but uh, Compton Davis has written a fantastic book um, uh, on the, the wooden houses of, of, of Guyana. Um, so sadly, there is, a house on the, I mean, there is a house on the site, but sadly it's not the original house. I mean, in my imagining, I imagine Agatha Elizabeth um, rather lonely, not really trusting of her youngest son who stayed behind and her daughter-in-law. Um, Frank talks about how burglars came into the house while she was still in the house and stole things and they owed back taxes and I think they nearly lost the house entirely. And I imagine her as an elderly lady, uh, weakening, rather alone. Um, and that once she passed, the house probably was, you see them all cross Guyana, these beautiful, beautiful colonial houses with fretwork, and, but they're, they're, they are, they're decaying and collapsing. It's a very, very humid environment. It's very hot. The wood, if treated and looked after and shepherded, um, will last. But there's a sort of a decaying there. Um, a kind of an irony of Guyana, I think. It's an, an extraordinary place. Incredible people. The Guyanese diaspora is, you know, huge and a lot of influential people. Um, a lot of beauty and a lot of incredible natural resources, but also a lot of um, decrepitude and, you know, all kinds of sort of social problems and, you know, problems in maintaining the infrastructure. Um, so, I mean, I've stayed in the house on the site, and it's, you know, it, it's still, you know, you still have the view out of the Catholic Church, the houses next door. I think that palm tree or the palm tree, you know, like it is still there. It still feels like, um, oh, I grew up in Worcestershire, so it's not, you know, <laughs> born in London, grew up in Worcestershire, so it's not kind of, it's a kind of fictitious home. There's, there, is, there is a home-like quality to it, even though I grew up, you know, in England, I knew nothing about Guyana until, you know, I was in my 40s, really. I didn't ever visit until I was in my 40s. So these houses were uh, tucked away for a long time, but in the last eight years or so, they've had a really lovely curatorial visibility in Okuya Wenzer's exhibition at House de Kunst, um, Mapa Mundi, I think four... Okuya Windsor had selected four of the mother's house paintings for that exhibition. And then here at the Tate in the 2019 show, there were about seven of them there. And then now in the States, recently just finished touring, the Frank Bowling America's exhibition had a lovely nine of them gathered together. So it's really lovely to see them little by little coming together. Um, and hopefully we're working on it to reunite all of them um, together. What does it mean for you, for the studio, for your father, to see this resurgence of interest and curatorial visibility of these paintings that were really stored away and tucked away for a long time? Well, it's joyous. Um, in a way, it's sort of... It reflects Dad's career, really. I mean, he didn't have representation in the UK until sometime in the 2000s. So, you know, most of his career he didn't have a commercial gallery representation. He barely sold any paintings in England. Um, I mean, he did well in the early 60s, 
left for New York in the mid-60s, disappointed by how England was treating him, and you know, made, a, made a living in the USA. But when he returned um, to London in 1975, it, you know, during the 70s and the 80s, and the 90s, it was tough, 70s, 80s in particular. Um, nobody was looking at his work. Nobody was interested in his work at all. These enormous map paintings that people swoon over, people would, you know, would look at them and, you know, 21 feet wide <laughs> paintings. They kind of go, oh, yeah, yeah, waves. Um, so the fact that, that his career has taken this turn in his 80s, really, he'll be 90 later this month, um, is a source of great joy. Uh, obviously, the, the success of the map paintings as a, as a series is... Fantastic. Um, probably a little boring. Now after, you know, because it's sort of so, um, no, they're beautiful paintings, but it's kind of become so repetitious. So I think that it's wonderful that curators, um, collectors, others, particularly students, um, are engaging with different bodies of work. And I, f I feel that the Mother's House series is I mean, there's the very early works, the early figurative works, and the idea of the mother's house as a kind of transitional motif. Um, I could get a bit psychoanalytic there, but it it marks it marks. It's one of the markers of the transition from ab, from figuration to abstraction, and allows, particularly as you see the the as you see the image disappearing, and then eventually by, you know, by the time of Hafif, 1969, 1970, all uh, figurative elements have disappeared and then it's just pure color from then on. Except for a return in the 1990s and early 2000s to the mother's house. I, I don't really know the story, but the lines behind those, but he, he, he reworked some of those and they are, they're called things like mothershouse.com. Um, always playful in the title. So it's, it's, it's a great joy. And the idea of uh, an exhibition, you know, um, in a museum, uh, of as many of the series as can be assembled from the very stark, you know, it's a, there's a couple of works on paper that are just the stencil of the, of the house through to the, to the very late ones. And to see that transition and to see them in repetition in the way you might see Warhol's Marilyn's or... Jackie's, um, and also to do as you've been doing, to dig into the aesthetic, I mean, the, the geometry of what's going on in there and, the, and the, the, the collage and the metistage and all the stuff that's going on in those works and then they're, they're gradually erasure. I, I, I think it's, um, I think it's gonna be a great show. Um, with a with a fantastic book, and um, uh, you know, I hope, I hope Dad will see it come to fruition. And I think that it's a it's a tremendous project. And you also mentioned the detective element of it. I mean, I'm people are encouraging me to see the links between criminology and art history, because I'm an art history dunce. I mean, I've met, this is my first visit to this incredible place today. Um, you know, I'm. I know about art only through the, my mother's work, my father's work. Um, so I'm, you know, I need Art History 101. Um, but um, to, to find, as we have done, like there's mother's, look, there it is. And there is the most the iconic image, but some of the works also have some of the other mother's house photographs in there. And of course, his mother herself, her appearance, she appears, her face appears and my brothers appear. So the way that, that the family and the family home appear, it's, um, it's, it's very moving and very, um, they're, for me, they're very, they're very beautiful. They're aesthetically very pleasing. Um, but it's also a deeply emotional kind of journey looking at these works. So I really appreciate what you've done in bringing them to light. Thank you. Yes. Um, 
this is a question from Carmen B. Oh, it's a comment and a, and a question. Um, I'm going to read it as is. So I'm going to be Carmen B. for the purposes of reading this out. Hi, Ben. My father is Guyanese, born in 1938. Um, and his family had a big house on, is it Lamahar Street in Georgetown, which hosted lots of dramatics and musical shows, as his granduncle was Masalil Pollard, the great sitar player of Guyana. Um, I wanted to ask if there are any plans for a Sir Frank Bowling Museum in Guyana. So it's kind of picking up this question of legacy and, and remembering. Um, I am also an artist, and your father's art is brilliant. Well, that's thank you so much. That's absolutely wonderful. Um, most appreciated. Um, and I didn't know about the great sitar player of Guyana, so that's um, a new line of inquiry, I think. Um, Frank Bowling Museum. Well, uh, that's a big undertaking. I mean, so I've been working with my brother for the last five years um, in working to develop, to protect and preserve the, the artworks themselves, the archive, the studio in Peacock, like Peacock Yard in, 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 um, in Southwark, um, where Dad's worked for the last 40 years. That, that's our first priority. Um, I'm beginning, we are beginning to imagine as a studio what a, you know, a studio museum might look like. So the studio itself is very, you know, interesting and beautiful. And we do have, we do host visits. We had a group from the court hall yesterday, which was wonderful. And we have, you know, ideas about how we might um, develop um, sort of public education um, in relation to the work and plans for the, you know, Frank Bowling Foundation. A museum in Guyana is, would be a massive undertaking. Um, um, I, I can see <laughs> the members of the studio team in the audience kind of going, oh no, <laughs> oh no, not yet. Um, it's a fantastic idea and I really appreciate the suggestion. Uh, I'm gonna put it on the uh, you know, possible mad ideas that you might have before breakfast um, that may be realizable in the decades to come. I, I really appreciate the suggestion, thank you. Uh, any questions or comments from the room? I mean, there's, there's a, there is a follow-on question, which is, um, what museums are there in Guyana anyway, in terms of art museums? Um, and because there's a question here from um, Katie Robson, which is, um, thank you for a wonderful talk. I'm going to put that in. Uh, where are the works located? Are they in public, private collections? So it's a kind of two-part thing, really, about you know w w w what's existing museums in Ghana like? Is there a chance for representation, but also where the works are now? So there's a national museum, art museum, called Castellani House, which does have a uh, Pisces. It's a, a very heavily built-up 80s work. Um, which I've seen and is very beautiful. Um, Guyana, and it's in a, it's in a, and it's in a beautiful uh, old wooden house in, in Georgetown, very close to the Botanical Gardens and Zoo. Botanical Gardens was definitely worth a visit. There's a zoo, not so much. Um, but, you know, it's a country with sort of 90% humidity, often, um, on the edge of the rainforest. Very, very hot. Conservator's nightmare. Um, I mean, I think Castellani House, it does host exhibitions. It's as vibrant as it, as it can be. It's, uh, you know, Guyana, as I said, it's an incredible place. I think superlative natural resources, gold, bauxite, timber, you know, tremendous human resources. Um, but, um, you know, under-resourced. Without any doubt, Castellani House. I think it needs it needs support. As to where the um, the works are, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so Dad's work is in about fifty public collections worldwide, mostly in the USA and the UK. Not so much in Europe, although it's beginning to happen. Um, the Mother's House works are. I would say I can think of a couple that are in public collections. Mostly, particularly the very early ones, are 
mostly in private collections. Um, and I don't know where they are. I was told by a gallerist probably five years ago, it's a terribly bad idea for artists to know where their paintings are. <laughs> um, so we're working on that. We are, you know, we have a, a research team who are, you know, uh, increasingly works are coming, collectors are coming to the studio to say, I've got this painting, could you tell me a bit about it? But the, the Mother's House works, I think probably, what do we think, that's about 25 or 30 paintings? I would say we, that we, we, know, of. That we know of. I would say knowing for sure, we probably know for sure where maybe half or maybe 20 of them are. Oh, no, we know for sure maybe 15. And there's a few others that we know who knows, even if we don't know ourselves. And we have some lines of inquiry for the detectives, the art detectives <laughs> to get out there. Mr. Just, Foley was also very generous at that time, so he was giving away paintings. Yeah. <laughs> so that's also part of the beautiful dilemma of finding where they are. Exactly. And a few, a few are, you know, with the family and in the infantry. I think, well, sadly, the clock is against us, but I think there's a, there's a question from Thank the middle so there, much. and then maybe one more after that. Yeah. Really, really fascinating. Um, I wondered if you could talk a bit more about the wider architectures and infrastructures in Guyana. I think when you use a phrase like colonial architecture, for many people, in part because it's so broad, it evokes kind of images of the sort of magnificent seven, perhaps, in Trinidad, and these very overtly European-looking architectures. And I was really struck, I saw the Frank Bowling painting as part of Entangled Pasts, and there's another work in that exhibition that reimagines the Magnificent Seven, for instance, in, in wood. And I was wondering if you could talk a bit more about like the particular kinds of infrastructures, architectures in Guyana. I will point you to the person that has done and Ben mentioned him, Compton Davis has done the only book so far on the history of these houses in Guyana, and it's called the Wooden Houses of the Wooden Houses of Guyana. I believe that's the title. So he's the expert on it, and I would send you his way. It's a beautiful, beautifully shot, beautifully stunning photographs of the houses that are still in Guyana and the ones that are in disrepair as well. And even in disrepair, I think they're still stunning and gorgeous. But he also is an architect, so he goes into the architectural history and how Guyanese builders were learning from the British to also combine both of these different ways of thinking about the home into one singular architecture. Okay, I think well, one more question here on the front row. Um, thanks. <laughs> Wonderful talk, thanks. Um, my question is about just looking at this house. Um, who did Frank grow up with? How was that house divided? Was it, you know, what was the family there like? And then a question about migration and when he came here, do we know where he lived there? In, in, you know, in terms of houses and movements and people. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so the ground floor, so one of the interesting things about the Um, so the ground floor is the shop at the front. This is all the variety store, and you can see the when you see the footage. There was a, the, the clip actually is on Instagram if you're interested. You can see the hats, and you can see into the house. The back kitchen, um, uh, where there's sort of living spaces, kitchen, um, and on this footage from '68, there's this tremendous film of um, Agatha Elizabeth bringing the beggars from the street into the house um, where, where dad would be asked to wash their hands and feet um, and then would they be fed and it just always struck me as a kind of like almost fantastical story but the, to see the film of it is absolutely it's, it's astonishing and there's another series of works the beggar paintings um, First floor is um, a big living room, and there are some interior photographs. Um, lots of plants. She kept 
you know, tropical plants indoors, and then bedrooms. And then I think it's notable in the 1953 photograph that the upper floor doesn't have windows. There are no, there no jalousies, no shutters. So, but by 68, um, so these would have been bedrooms. Um, Dad was one of four. So um, Maisie, my auntie Maisie, who I met, who was wonderful, uh, elder sister, then Frankie, and then Chetwind, who, so Maisie left to go to LA to be a nurse. Uh, my uncle Chet, his next brother down, went to Puerto Rico to become a nurse and then trained as a doctor and did community medicine his entire career in Philadelphia. And then Watson, my uncle Watson stayed in, 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 uh, in New Amsterdam, sadly died um, of COVID in 2020. And his, his wife Camille died just a little bit before that. And then briefly, um, dad's journey so he arrives in England in 1953, stays with an uncle, and then joins the RAF, serves his national service in the RAF, and then um, was befriended by artists. Keith Critchlow was one particular man, a medic in the RAF, who, you know, he sort of couch surfed, I think, then to the Royal College, 62. And, um, and then he's, I guess he's been living in Pimlico where he still lives today, um, since the sort of, he lived in, um, um, Cl uh, in Clapham, near Clapham Common in the late 50s, early 60s, and then moved to Pimlico, and he's lived in Pimlico, apart from the periods of being in New York, um, ever since, where he is right now, and he's still working. Um, I've still got, I um, was in the studio today with him, he's painting, he's in the studio three times a week, He's just made this massive painting, um, three meters tall and seven meters across, which um, will be um, on on display uh, for his 90th at um, Hausenworth Savile Row. I think from you know, from next week, 22nd. But the isn't it something like the 14th that it actually yeah. begins? It's open, so it'll be on for a month. Just these two very very large works. One recently made, and he um, extremely ambitious. We were talking about um, collage last night. I went into the studio today, and he's like, "Where's that? Where's all that? That bag of old bits of African fabric? And do this and get this." And so he's he's on collage again. So um, yeah, he's uh, he's remains an extremely ambitious man, even at the age of ninety. Long may it continue. Okay, this is such a fantastic conversation. We're going to squeeze in one more question um, from online because I think there'll be the chance for those of you here in Bedford Square to continue the conversation next door. Um, and this is from uh, Jason Cyrus. <coughs> Hi, Grace and Ben. It's Jason Cyrus. Apologies as I could not be there um, this evening uh, as planned. Thank you for a superb presentation that, uh, as much illuminating as it was, was also deeply moving. As someone born and raised in Guyana, I found myself becoming quite emotional at, at many points. How might we take, how, sorry, how might these paintings and Frank's work overall help to galvanize interest amongst the Guyanese diaspora like myself in taking an active role in preserving and investing in our heritage? I thought a good question to kind of, a big one, but a good question to, to, to end on. It's a cracking question, and I get coming down, wasn't it? Coming right back at you, really. Um, someone needs to do it um, for sure. I think, I think Compton, Compton Davis's book, and he's, you know, I think there's there's an architectural. Actually, there is a, a, a Facebook group that shares information about the um, about the houses and seeks to preserve them. And as I said, the the main cathedral has been completely restored. Um, so I guess, I mean, there are also influential people, you know, uh, quite a lot of British politicians are, of Guyanese heritage, David Lammy. Um, I feel a letter writing campaign coming up. <laughs> um, so yeah, Grace. I think that's right. 
Um, thank you, Jason, for a question that should take us a few hours to answer. I think the way I would respond to that, it's, for me, it's it's the scholarship, it's the study of this work that's a part of galvanizing our community. And I'll share with you all, you know, for the researchers in the room to do this work on these particular paintings, I'm often in the footnotes. I'm living in the footnotes. So much about the house and Frank's mom and about New Amsterdam isn't in the main pages. It's in the footnotes. And so we've got to get it out of the footnotes, first of all, and into the main narrative of understanding these paintings. And so I think there is a really wonderful opportunity to create and develop new, exciting scholarship. And that's the role I think curators like me can play and researchers like me can play in, is just really taking on the scholarship part of it. Okay, with that, I think we do need to um, close the formal part of this evening, um, uh, we'll bring that to, a, to an end. Um, it's been, I'm sure everybody will agree, online and in the room, such an amazing evening to hear scholarship, thoughtful reflection, but also memory and life kind of intertwined um, so, so richly. So um, I'm sure you will join me in thanking Grace and Ben for their uh, presentations. Thank you.